Hi, I'm Gareth Green and in this video we're going to look at the first two phrases of one of Bart's chorales. It's number 364 in the Riemann Schneider collection if you want to find the whole chorale, but you certainly don't need to for this video. We're just going to have a look at what happens in these first two phrases with a particular focus on how Bart goes about a kind of double modulation. So modulation, changing keys, you know, something when people are writing music they're often a bit reluctant to do or not feeling terribly confident about changing key. But if they change key, often they change key, think great, done it. Maybe just come back to the original key. But what happens if you want to move through, say, two keys quite quickly back to back? That's one thing that we're going to be thinking about looking at these two phrases. OK, well, let's have a listen to these two phrases. The home key is B minor. OK, so let's see what Bach is up to. Well, first of all, he has an anacrusic start. We start on the last beat of a four-time bar. And when he does that, he often starts on the dominant chord. So we're in the key of B minor, but we're starting with an F-sharp major chord. There's something to be said for this, because if you start on an upbeat, starting any piece of music going dominant, tonic works quite well because the tonic is the strongest chord in the hierarchy of chords within a scale. The dominant is the next strongest. So to start on the second strongest and go to the strongest is a good way of dealing with an upbeat. You don't have to. And Bach sometimes uses a tonic chord followed by a tonic chord. He'll just go 1-1 one, one and do something like that. Often he makes the bass part leap an octave. B, B will do that kind of thing. But this 5-1 start, you can feel this sense of you get a lift on the 5 and then it kind of sits down on the 1 on the first beat of the next bar. So that's the reasoning for that. OK, so we start song called 5. He has a passing note in the bass. It's an unaccented passing note, which also happens to turn the chord 5 into a 5-7. It's a 5-7, dominant 7th, in its last inversion. So he's enriching the initial chord 5 by including that passing note and turning it into a 5-7 last inversion. And of course, it makes the bass flow on. And Bach loves to write these kind of scalic bass lines. So that even though it's a bass line, it's got its own kind of melodic identity. So do you see how we almost go down a whole octave of a scale in those first few notes? And another reason why he does that is because the melody at the top is going in the opposite direction. We start on this dominant note, we go to the tonic note, and then we climb up the scale. So you see how that's happening? So we've got the outer part starting here and doing this contrary motion. something he loves to do and it's very effective. And also if you do that, if you get this contrary motion between the outer parts and a sort of sense of this happening as you go, it helps you not to break various rules of harmony. So parallel fifths, parallel octaves, you might know them as consecutive fifths, consecutive octaves, often come about if the top and the bottom are moving in the same direction. So if you can have a little bit of this going on, it's far less likely that you'll have those kind of problems. OK, so, you know, this is what he's up to. So we're starting on this chord five. We've talked about the passing note. And then when he comes on to the first chord of the first complete bar, you might say, OK, it's a tonic chord, but why does Bach write the tonic chord in first inversion? Wouldn't it have been stronger to have it in root position? Well, it would have been, no doubt about that. Maybe this is slightly weaker. I think he's done it partly to keep that scale run going in the bass that we talked about, but also he's using here a little device called the passing 6-4. So across these three chords, we've got this chord one in first inversion, and then we've got this intervening chord 
before we go to one in root position. So your tonic chord in root position actually happens when you get there. Now, these passing 6-4s. Six 6-4 four. Six four is another way of describing a second inversion chord. So quite often we go one in first inversion, five in second inversion, so that's the 6-4 chord, then one in root position. So one first inversion, five in second inversion, one root position. We can do it the other way around. But if you want to make it even stronger, instead of using a five in second inversion, you can replace that with a chord seven in first inversion. It's just a bit stronger. And Bach loves to do that. So this is a kind of, if you like, what we might call a replacement passing 6-4. So by having the bass go to that D there in the first inversion, he facilitates this replacement passing 6-4. And Bach being Bach, you know, he can't just do the obvious, he has to do something even more kind of refined. You'll notice he has this different rhythm in the tenor. So instead of just having two crotchets or two quarter notes like the other three parts, he delays the tenor by having a dotted quarter note or a dotted crotchet followed by a quaver or an eighth note. And that has an impact because this B is the preparation for a suspension because the B is still sounding when we hear this chord. So the B belongs to the first chord. It's the preparation of a suspension. It's a clash here, but it's still sounding. So this is where the suspension occurs. And then it resolves by step downwards. So you end up with P, S, R, the three requirements for a suspension. P and S must be the same note. Well, they are because the B is still sounding. When you go to R, you've got to resolve by step, usually downwards. Well, that's exactly what happens here. P must belong to its prevailing chord. It belongs to that chord one, that's great. And R must resolve to the next prevailing chord. So it all belongs to this chord 7B. So he's used a passing 6-4 replacement and then he's imposed what we're gonna call a 7-6 suspension because it's going 7-6 above the bass. So it makes for a great start. So many composers, when at the beginning of a piece of music, they think, well, you know, I'm writing a piece of music in B minor, so the first thing to do is just kind of get B minor established before we go anywhere. Well, Bach does that, but he's ready to engage with his listener straight away. So he doesn't just say, well, we'll just warm up in B minor for a bit and then we'll see where we can go. He's straight on to five. Passing note makes it five, seven, last inversion. Oh, Passing 6-4, but not passing 6-4, passing 6-4 replacement. And then let's have a 7-6 suspension in the middle of it as well. So there's musical interest absolutely engaging us from the outset. Okay, well, we're now on this third beat of the first bar. Notice a bit of movement in the alto part there. And he's not writing passing notes, passing tones or anything like that. He's hopping from one chord tone to another, one harmony note to another. So don't forget, if you want to generate rhythm, one way is just to jump to another note that belongs to the chord. The bass line is on the go at the same time, but in the bass line, we have an unaccented passing note. So there's a, a chord note, there's an unaccented passing tone or a passing note. And now life gets interesting because we've done the establishment of B minor as the home key across those four chords. But when we come to this chord, this becomes a pivot chord. So this is the chord that we're going to use as a modulation point. This B minor chord is called one in the home key of B minor, but it's also called two in A major. So once we've passed through that, if we treat it as a pivot chord, one in B minor and two in A major, we're then free to move to A major, which is exactly what happens on the next beat, because you notice we've got G sharps. So we're moving through the pivot chord here into a new key of A major there. So have a listen to that from the beginning. Here's the B minor pivot 
A major dominant chord. You can feel it's moved into A major through that pivot chord. Okay, now what are we expecting to happen now then? Well, if we're modulating to A major, well, we're surely going to establish A major. So we do this, we go through the dominant chord and then we go to A major. And that's what we're expecting to happen, isn't it? But Bart Bing Bark says, yeah, that's what you're expecting, so let's not do that. Let's do something else. Hmm. So we go from the last chord of this bar, the five in A major, and then when we get here, we think that's going to be a tonic chord of A major. Actually, what does he do? Oh my goodness, there's all sorts of funny stuff going on here, isn't there? But really, it's more of a chord of F sharp minor. Well, how does he bring this about? Well, F sharp minor, well, it's called one in F sharp minor. It's also called six in A major. So we've used five in A major after a pivot chord. Now we've gone to six in A major, but it's also one in F sharp minor. Why am I saying that? Because after this chord, he then has a cadence in F sharp minor. He goes chord five to chord one. But Bart Bing Bark, it's never going to be quite as straightforward as it could be. So what does he do? Well, we've got C sharp in the tune. That's great. That belongs to this F sharp minor chord. We've got A in the bass. That belongs to the F sharp minor chord. So that's all fine. OK, we've got F sharp here on the second eighth note, the second quaver note of the bar. So that belongs to the chord. So what's the rest of it about? We have an unaccented passing note in the bass there. So that's why the B is there. Why have we got B in the tenor here? Because that doesn't belong to our chord of F sharp minor. It's because it's another suspension. Do you notice this B is prepared here? It sounded here and it's resolved there. So P and S, same note. P belongs to this chord, S is dissonant with this chord, then there's a resolution by step normally downwards, and this does belong to the F sharp minor chord. So that is PSR, a suspension. And effectively, this is a ninth above the bass. The bass is on the move, but it's a kind of nine eight suspension. So that's what that's doing. But not content to leave it at that, my goodness me, what's also going on up here? we've got another suspension going on in the alto. So P, S, R. So do you see what's, what's happening there? So basically, um, above the A, this is um, a seven. So it's a seven, six suspension in the alto, even though the bass is moving. But you see that P belongs to this chord of E major. This S is dissonant. And then it resolves downwards by step to F sharp, which is constant. So that's how I know that this, believe it or not, is a chord of F sharp minor, even though we've got embellishments going on. But if you look at these middle parts, double suspension. So that really hots it up. So we think we're going into A major. We're all set for a tonic chord of A major. We don't get it. We get chord six in A major, which is called one in F sharp minor. So he's kind of using that as another pivot. And furthermore, he decorates it with these um, double suspensions, as well as a passing note down on the bass there. Uh, so it's all happening. And then when we come to this point, we've got chord five in F sharp minor. So that's why we've got the E sharps there, in case you were wondering. This D sharp in the alto then is a lower auxiliary note. And then when we move here, we've got a passing note in the soprano part, the treble line at the top, but it's making it into a five seven again. So another instance of five becoming richer as we're using a five seven and the seventh being used as a kind of passing note. Then we get to the tonic chord of F sharp minor. So to see what he's done there, he started in B minor, he's taken us to A major, never fully kind of captured A major before taking another twist and pushing us into F sharp minor. So it's a very clever kind of double modulation that goes on there. So have a listen to that first phrase. wonderful 
simple stuff, isn't it? And because of all that complexity in the first phrase, I'm going to suggest that's why the second phrase isn't quite so complicated. Bing bark is not straightforward, but it's not quite so complicated. So the second phrase begins with the F-sharp minor chord we've just heard. And remember I was saying earlier, sometimes he repeats a tonic chord and allows the bass to leap up an octave. Well, that's what's happening there. So we finish there, then the bass goes up an octave. An unaccented passing note in the bass there. And then we're going on to a B minor chord. Okay, why B minor chord? Well, it's chord four and F-sharp minor but it's also chord one in our home key of B minor. So we're sort of on our way back to the B minor thing. So this is one in first inversion in B minor. The bass jumps to another harmony note. The tenor has an unaccented passing note. Then we go on to this, which is a chord four in first inversion in B minor. This is a lower auxiliary note or a lower neighbor tone. And then when we come on to the next chord, rather nice touch here, you think it might just be a chord five or something, but actually that's a diminished seventh in B minor. So A sharp, C sharp, E, G, a whole load of minor thirds, all built on chord seven in B minor. So that's a diminished seventh in B minor. In the melodic line at the top, there's a lower auxiliary, a lower neighbor tone. And then we've got a dominant seventh in first inversion, a little bit of decoration here where we're just going up and coming back. Is that a neighbor tone or an upper auxiliary note or is the F sharp just another part of the harmony? Both are true. And then we finish on the chord one. So there's a lovely balance actually. We've got all this complexity of this double modulation going on in the first phrase with all that additional decoration. And then we've still got interesting things in the second phrase, plenty of rhythmic movement, but it's slightly less complicated than the first phrase. So it kind of provides a balance. So let's put those two phrases together in the light of all that. wonderful stuff, isn't it? Well, if you've enjoyed this video, you might like to go to the Music Matters website to see what we can offer you there. www.mmcourses.co.uk and you'll find there all of our courses, online courses. The YouTube videos are all one-offs, kind of covering all sorts of different topics. But when you go onto our courses, you'll find structured teaching that gets hold of a topic like music theory. And we start at the very beginning and we work progressively through as much of the journey as we can cover. And we're doing that in oral training, we're doing it in orchestration, we're doing it in analysis, lots of different ways. So if you're looking for something that's really progressive, then that's the place to go and see what you make of that. Lots of things on the, on the website, blogs and other things as well. Access to tuition, anything you want to find there, hopefully you will find it. While you're on the homepage, click on Maestros and you'll discover about our global musical community and a lovely, lovely group of people, uh, all sorts of musical backgrounds, all sorts of different stages, and that doesn't matter at all. It's great for that interaction to take place. And if you do become a maestro, well, you'll get discounts on our online courses, so that's a big perk, as well as emojis and badges and early access to videos, behind the scenes content, all sorts of details there. In particular, you'll be able to attend our monthly live streams, a couple of live streams every month, one of which is a kind of in-depth teaching session where I just kind of go as fast and as deep as we can into topics often suggested by members of the group. And the other live stream where you can offer your own composition, harmony exercises, arrangements, whatever you want to do. And I'll give you one-to-one -one feedback on that. And we run a live chat so we can interact. We share the material so we all learn from each other. And people find that a wonderfully kind of creative zone and a wonderfully kind of mutually supportive zone as well. So you might be interested in seeing if that's for you.